As you know, today we are exploring another alternative future narrative. This story, The Handmaid's Tale, is told by Offred, or of Fred, meaning that she is owned by a man named Fred. And that is her owner's name. She is one of the women who is still capable of having Childbearing thus has become a precious commodity in this future. And, are, and those women who can bear children are controlled by men in power and the barren women who are married to them. This tale is a tale of slavery, domination, and resistance. Atwood would describe all of her stories, though, by saying they're not fictional. She rejects this label of science fiction in an article that she, uh, that she gave for the New York Times. All of her tales, she said, are carefully researched in our human history. And we can see this in the examples in the homily that Chris just gave. The tales of Rachel, the tales of Sarah. So in 2017, the TV version of this book came out on Hulu with roaring success. And the TV version veers greatly from the book version, so if you ask me, read the book and then watch the TV show. Both are different, but both speak to this subject in many faceted ways which are valuable. So why? Do I keep holding up these dark novels to you as sacred text? <laughs> well, as a woman, I'm worried about the rise in the governmental control of women's bodies. How states are trying to pass laws to do away with abortion, the morning after pill, social services that directly affect women and children. I worry about the way those in power talk about women and women's bodies, and how they're trying to bring back the good old days where women had a special role, you know, elevated but very restricted. And like Orwell's 1984, The Handmaid's Tale is experiencing a resurgence of interest as we navigate this new campaign, this new crusade on women. And I believe it is a battle. Access to women's bodies and labor has been central to economic viability of our global economy. As access to sex and progeny has been central to men and religious institutions. Sharon Welsh points out in The Feminist Ethic of Risk that as long as women are responsible for children, home, and errands, men are free to pursue their goals unfettered. It is just an economic fact that to control women's bodies is financial as well as sexual. We need to remember that. It's like, you know, my sociology teacher said, follow the money. Follow the money. That's what's pushing our global economy. So why is there a fire lit by the handmaid's tale? Why is it sacred? I believe, like Welch, that books, these darker tales, are sacred because they hold dangerous memories. They hold dangerous memories. Like the Bible tale of Rachel and Hagar, the narrative of Offred holds memories of struggle and resistance. But unlike the Bible, it is a narrative by a woman. It's told from Hagar's point of view, from Offred's point of view. It's a fuller tale than that short narrative. It fulfills the many wishes of women to hear Hagar's voice. And so what can we glean from this story? One thing I remember is the story that's told early on in the book of the frog and the boiling water. How many of you know that tale? Yeah, that's right. 
told early in the book, it is to remind us of the trap that little political moves can make. It also reminds us that chaos is a tool used by the rich and powerful to control the middle class. And it's been done in our history before. These are not new stories. We need to keep a level head. I'm going to say it again. We need to keep a level head. I want you to say it. We need to keep a level head. We need to pay attention to what's going on behind the curtain. How many times in this current chaos of today has one thing been going on over here and they're deregulating stuff over here? It's a way to control us. It's a way to keep us anxious all the time. It's a tool. So we have to meditate. We have to take hot baths. We have to turn the news off. We have to play with our children. We have to keep a level head and not react. It means not getting overwhelmed by periodic defeats. It means taking risks and knowing our opponent. And we now know that race, right, was created by the rich to keep the poor from joining together and overthrowing in our country. Early on, there was no race. There were poor and there were rich. And race was created. So we need to pay attention. We need to see how are we being divided. Could abortion be that issue among women? I don't know. It's something to think about. As I was writing this, I was like, all right, I'm asking you to think about it. I need to think about it. And I wondered, is that an issue that's dividing us so that we don't come together and work together? We need to be careful about what divides us. Well, who is saved and who is damned on both sides of the aisle? We need to see what is really left and what is really right. Offred says, maybe none of this is about control. Maybe it's really about who can do what to whom? Who can get away with it, even as far as death? Maybe it isn't about who can sit and who can kneel or who can stand and lie down legs spread open. Maybe it's about who can do what to whom and be forgiven for it. Never tell me that it amounts to the same thing. What I'm hoping we do in this month of sacred text and today is to start a conversation about our, div our divisions and who's controlling them. I want to troll dangerous memories and see what they have to teach us. And we have them in art and in literature, hints and signposts and warnings. For our current struggle, we have them. We can look and we can learn and we can read and we can look at art and we can see. We need a non-anxious presence and a community with their eyes and ears and whole selves paying attention to what is really going on. And we do this as Unitarian Universalists by staying hopeful. I want you to say that with me too. We stay hopeful. Can you say it a little louder? <laughs> we stay hopeful. We stay hopeful. And I don't mean in this ascensionist theology that we used to have. Love Skinner, though I do. I don't believe we're like getting better and better and better. We know that after Skinner came World War II. You know, I believe in a naturalistic theology where there are floods and earthquakes and fires. And that may be what we need to move towards a just society. Under other governments, was I working for women's rights? 
No. I was doing it individually. I could tell you stories. But this year, I'm going to work for voter registration this election. Yes. I'm going to do something big because it's not enough for me to individually work on patriarchy. I, I am really going to do that. So Atwood describes herself as being the kind of child who buried things in the backyard in jars, hoping that someone else would dig them up sometimes. And she goes on to say, it is not a question of expect. It is a question of hope. It is a question of faith rather than knowledge. You wouldn't do it unless you thought there was a chance. And I believe we have a chance. Humans, she says, have hope built in, adding that if our ancestors had not had that component, they would not have bothered getting up in the morning. And you always are going to have hope that today there'll be a giraffe, or for my ancestors, an apple tree or a cow, where yesterday there wasn't one. I find hope in modern sacred texts like The Handmaid's Tale. I see dangerous memories retold with fuller voices. I see myself in the solution. I can put myself in that book. And I also see the warnings that Offred describes in the narratives of her life. She thought that it was not possible to go backwards and lose rights. She says that very clearly early on in the book. She and other middle class women didn't see the trap doors ahead and so went on living and loving like their future was not at stake. And we know better, right? Can I hear an amen or a holy yes? yes. We will not make that mistake. Amen. And the people said, amen and blessed be. So join with me in our closing hymn, Singing Amazing Grace, number 205. But I want you to think about the words a little differently. This week, while I was writing the sermon, I heard a song by Chris Jansen, and he was singing a song about drunk girls and leaving them alone. I know, a country western song that talks about Treating women with respect. I'll tell you, I was in the back of a taxi and I was crying at 4 o'clock in the morning. It was so amazing. So I want you to listen to this song and think about redemption in a new way.